Hey, I'm here with Bryant Madron, and uh, Bryant, thanks for taking time hey, with us today. Alan, glad to be here, man. Appreciate it, appreciate it. Um, I want to focus a little bit today on, I come across a lot of growers, and man, growing chickens, you got to get creative. That's right. First of all, I'd like to talk about this drip line. Tell me two things. Number one, why, I see a lot of growers don't do this, mm -hmm. so why would it be important, and then maybe kind of ease into what you did to make it a little easier for you. Okay, one of the challenges whenever you build poultry houses is um, the, the mass area that you've got to grade. Sometimes you've actually got cut in the front, fill in the back, or you've got cut in the back and fill in the sure. front, and so between your end houses, there's a lot of soil unstabilization. And I experienced the same thing when I first built these houses back in 2016. I did not do any drip line, any erosion control. And on the end of house number one, on the far side, and on the end of number six, where the water came off and hit that grade, it cost me $17,000 to have that regraded oh and to put a little rock down the drip line. And now that, uh, that cost me because of my lack of experience. Yeah. And uh, so once I was available for the NCRS grant money to help with the drip line erosion control, I built a little jig to help put this rock out. And so hopefully this will control the erosion around the houses. Another reason is because if you have erosion problems, water can sometimes seep back in under the foundation oh, yeah, and create that. challenges inside the house. And I just wanted to avoid all that. So that's why I did what I did. Yeah, I've seen girls or at least come to me and go, hey man, I don't know what I got. I got an issue, but I got wet up against the floor and then they find out later, mm -hmm. I got seepage coming up under the loose dirt coming in, something like that. I also think to me, it looks nicer yeah. too. Yeah, and, and once that seepage begin to happen, it's hard to correct. So my philosophy is do it right the first time, yeah. do it right as soon as you can. And NCRS made this uh, available, made it happen. But you can look down the edge of that house. I don't know what you can see on camera, but you can look down the edge of the house and it comes out about 30 inches from that wall. Uh, and so it's coverage. Uh, NCRS wants 12 inches uh, both sides of the drip line coverage and so it just works out great and uh, it's very very simple to do a little time consuming but I, I, I spent about two million dollars here on my farm getting it to, to the, the way that it is and so anything I can do to protect my investment Absolutely. or to make my investment more valuable if I were to liquidate it down the road it's always the best option for me. The reason I made the jig is because first off, we, we came out here and attempted to just dump, dump a bucket of rocks and rake it out by hand, oh, which is which is okay yeah. if you've got uh, seven, eight, nine, ten people helping you. Sure. But if you're uh, a one man show or a two or three man show, this jig works best. So what I did, I just began to think about it. Um, and the concept kind of came out the way a box blade works. You know, you can yep. take a box blade and, and, and gravel goes in through the front and to, according to where the height is, yep. it can come out evenly out the back. So what I did was I measured off the house the, the width that NCRS wanted. Okay, so I created a box. And then in the back, uh, I used four inch, four inch, excuse me, I used five inch C channel on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then across the back of that five inch C channel, I welded a piece of four inch C channel that was a wiper. Okay. And so you would dump the rock in and as you pulled up, it would wipe this rock 30 inches wide, five inches thick. Now you oh, may wow. think, well, NCRS only requires four inches. Why did you do five? Because I didn't want them to come out here and measure and find low spots. Sure. I wanted to have a little extra to make sure that I met their satisfaction. And some of these rocks do settle. So I created myself a little buffer and a little nice. barrier for down the road. Now, something else I did as I was building the box, I thought, how, I'm going, how am I going to get the fabric? Because I wanted the landscaping fabric yeah. under that. Sure, so sure. what I did was I created a roller on the front of this jig. And then you pull it down, you pull the fabric down and you pull it under. And, and as you, the weight of the rock holds the, sure. the fabric as you pull up with the tractor, um, I've got, I had a roller that would roll the fabric off. And so when you pull up, you dump the rock, you pull up, it rolls the fabric off and um, it's, it, it's really well. My wife would drive, my wife would drive the tractor. <laughs> my son and I were running two skid steers, would pull oh, up, wow. drop the rock, she would pull up and uh, you can see it, it just worked really well. Nice. And so uh, my NCRS guy here, Randy Blackwood, has encouraged me to get this thing patented. He thinks that 
poultry farmers around the country could benefit sure. from it. So I'm actually toying with the idea of getting Very this cool. uh, this thing patented. Yeah. So we'll see. All right, now I also want to go move back to the composting shed. Let's go take a look. Let's do it. All right. All right, Bryant, you've been growing for six years. <clears throat> yes, sir. It's three years, as I understand, before NRSCS. You gotta be a grower for three years before NRSCS is gonna give you money. Right. But your contract says you gotta have composting shed. You yeah. gotta deal with it. Yeah. But if you gotta wait for three years, you can't. You gotta have it now. Right. What'd you do? I love your idea of what you did. Well, it uh, with the contract with the integrator that I grow for, there's a stipulation that you have to have some way to dispose of dead birds. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they give you two options. You have an incinerator or you've got composters. Yeah. Well, the challenge with an incinerator, when I built this farm, money was tight, I'm frugal, uh, I like to watch every penny that I spend. So I get online, I begin to price composters, but there was something that I didn't like about the idea that every time I disposed of my integrator's birds, that it was gonna cost me money to burn the fuel mm -hmm. to get rid of those birds. Yeah. I didn't like that idea. So the idea of natural decomposition just really spoke to me that that, that would be free, wouldn't cost me anything. It cost me maybe a few dollars for some shavings and then some chicken litter as you layer it in there to get the temperature right for them to decompose. So I've got a nephew that grows chickens that has a stack house similar to this one. And uh, so I went over there and I looked at his compost boxes to see the sizes and how they were built. And so on this very spot where this shed sits right now, I bought two 20 by 20 carports yeah. and underneath those carports, I built four compost bins identical to these back to back square boxes. And uh, it's, I, it cost me back in 2016, I spent $1,500 a piece for the carports. Yep. And then I spent up, that would be about 3000. And then I spent about another 2,500 to 3000 for the material. And I built those compost bin boxes, me, my brother, my brother-in-law, and a couple nephews came out here on a Saturday. And in one day we built that whole compost uh, beginning uh, facility for me. And it worked great. I used it for about five to six years. Wow. And then I qualified for the grant. Now, one of the challenges I had during that time period here in North Carolina, the law is you cannot leave litter outside uh, unsheltered for more than 14 days uncovered. Okay. So I had the compost side working, sure. but I didn't have the litter side really under control yeah. because once litter came out of the house, I had to get it up and spread it. Well, the challenge is in North Carolina, if you sell your birds in January, you're gonna be hard pressed to get a, on the sure. field. So there was a couple of times I had to cover it and spread it and wait for dry weather. That's a bear for me. So, sure. so I knew that when, once I qualified for the NCRS grant to help assist with this compost and litter shed, that, um, that I won't take advantage of that. And I did, this one here, um, if memory serves me correct, I think it's 42 or 44 foot wide, including, including the apron uh, to the ends. I think it's 180 feet to the ends of the concrete apron. Gotcha. And so the actual inside square footage, I think is 160 or 65 long. And yeah. so it, it works really great now for my operation. Uh, it, I'm able to self-contain. There's some litter you probably saw on the backside over there. And uh, because right now we're in the middle of crusting, my birds went out yesterday. So we're in the middle of crusting and putting that litter there. So when the end of February, beginning of March gets here, the optimal time for me to spread litter on my cow pastures. I, I have a small cow calf operation of about 50 mama cows. I bale about 700 rolls, 700, 750 rolls a hay a year. Wow. And so I need to utilize sure. that litter specifically for yeah. my forage operation and it works really good. And so I kept costs down, built that temporary situation. I knew those composters originally were gonna be temporary. And uh, when it was time to build this, I took it up. And uh, hey, I, I did the math and I know a young man that's got, a, got an incinerator and he spends about $1,500 to $2,000 per flock. Yeah. And if you grow five I'm flocks saying. a year, that's about $10,000 a year. Yep. And if you add that five years, I saved myself $50,000 in diesel fuel, but I only spent 5,000 in the beginning. Yeah. So if you're, you're thinking about poultry growing or you're a small farmer just getting started, you don't have to go and, and, and finance everything to, uh, to get started. You can be uh, innovative and make some things happen on your own. You can also probably tell that Bryant is a pastor. 
That's why I haven't had to talk much in this video, which <laughs> I like. So it's good. But hey, I've enjoyed it. Thanks yeah. again, Brian. Yes, sir, buddy. Anytime. Um, and I may, I will filter. If you got any questions, you know, I'm not going to be able to answer much on how to build a jig or those kind of things. But if you got any questions, I'll forward them on, and Brian will probably be more than happy to help us out. And so anything. Yep, sounds, sounds good, good, man. All right. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got something from it. If you got any other questions we can help you with, Alan at SouthlandOrganics.com or 1-800-608-3755. Until next time.